Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm a resident geologist at the Institute for Creation Research, so if you have any geology questions, I can try to answer those at the end. But tonight we're going to look at uh, something that's a little maybe less geologic and maybe a little more fun for some of you, but is the Ice Age. So we want to look a little bit at the kind of how the Ice Age began. Some of you, you know, back about the time of our American Civil War, nobody believed in an Ice Age at all. There was no consciousness of an Ice Age. It wasn't until some of the European geologists started finding rocks that were way out of place. And some of the strange things I'll show you tonight, that they realized there really was an ice age. And then, of course, about the same time, they started making the Earth really old and started insisting the Earth is millions and billions of years old and all that kind of stuff as well. Well, we don't hold to that. We hold to the biblical truth that the Bible, what it says about the genealogies in the book of Genesis, that the Earth is only about 6,000 years old. And so at ICR, that's, that's, we we're firm believers in the truth of God's word and everything about it. There's no special translation needed to try to fit in millions of years somewhere. We believe it's the way it's written, that all of the geology we see, including the Ice Age, all happened in the biblical timeline of the last 6,000 years. And in fact, the Ice Age was a product of the flood, the global flood. But tonight I'm going to concentrate on what happened after the flood. And that was the Ice Age, as we'll see why in a minute. So we'll look at some of the secrets of it. But we're going to start with a bit from God's Word, where in 2 Peter, Peter was told by God to write this. He said, In the last days there shall come, in the last days, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For this they are willingly or ignorant, that by the Word of God the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So here people are going to start saying, you know, there, where's, there's no evidence of God. The earth's always been, always has been. And that can, I kind of cut that part out of here. But there, basically he defines in Second Peter uniformitarianism. So there's really two worldviews. There's this uniformitarian view, which we're taught as you go to public schools and geology. You're taught in public schools, you know, in high school and everything else as well. You're taught this idea that the earth is billions of years old. And that volcanoes have always been volcanoes, and there's always been ice ages, and they even try to find evidence for other ice ages in the past. But there's really only strong evidence for one ice age, and that's the most recent one that you guys, if you were here 4,500 years ago or so, or even 4,000 years ago, maybe when it ended, you would have been in much different conditions than today. So there really was climate change. It took place after the ice age. And so we've been warming since the ice age for the last 4,000 years. So this, you know, modern day moving a few feet of sea level is nothing compared to what we'll see happen at the end of the Ice Age when it moved up hundreds of feet. So, but it's this uniformitarian view is what people hold to when they push God out of the picture. They believe the earth always was. The universe created itself from nothing and became what we have here today. And they say, well, it happened because we're here, which is really not very scientific. You can't test things. You can't have a box of nothing that's what they say, the universe came from nothing. So you have a box of nothing. You can watch it for a long, long time, and you're going to come back, and there's still going to be nothing in that box. But that's what they hold to, because they don't want to believe that there was a God. They don't want to believe that they are responsible for their sinful nature like we all are. Yeah, but God gave us a way out through his son, Jesus. Amen. Even though we're sinners, he loved us. While we were still yet sinners, he loved us. He still loves us. So we'll see he had a plan. Even the Ice Age was part of God's plan. So this uniformitarian you know, view kind of says this, like, like I've been trying to say, everything continues as it always has, no beginning, no end. The present is the key of the past. And James Hutton came up with that idea back about 1796, 1798. And he's the one that started throwing millions of years in there. Even before they could come up with ways to try to come up with those millions of years, he was already saying it. Because you can't imagine a million years. You can imagine 1,000, 10,000, maybe 100,000, but you jump to a million, you can't imagine that. So it's like monopoly money. So they throw these you know, years around, billions of years. They say the earth is 4.55 billion years old, but it means nothing. The Bible tells us something completely different. And the evidence that we see in the rocks shows the earth is young as well. And we'll see the ice age was an essential part of the end of the flood. So God's word is truth. If you hold to that, of course, it says in Exodus 20, 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. This is from the Ten Commandments. So God wrote this with his own hand. 
And people that argue the earth is old will say, well, day doesn't mean day. It means a long period of time. You know, God has a good command of the language. He could use different words. But throughout the Old Testament, whenever he talks about the creation week, it's always day, the Hebrew word for day. And then even at the creation week, he talks about there was morning, there was evening the first day. There was morning, there was evening the second day to emphasize day. Because he knew in the end times that people would start making up stuff, making up stories the earth is old, trying to push God out of the picture. But God says himself with his own hand, in six days, he made the earth, the sea, and all that was in them, including the universe. Uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism, whew, it's hard to say. It's like super supercadrophagilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> it's like one of those big English words that just means everything's uniform. You know, everything, like time never, it's always been going on. There's no beginning, no end. That's their philosophy from the secular community. But the biblical worldview, of course, we had a beginning. God created everything in the beginning. He created Adam and Eve in the beginning. He created a man and woman in the beginning. He uses the word beginning because that was the beginning. And so even in the New Testament. But you know from materialism, their ideas of, of ice ages are coming along every so often. doesn't really work. They have this idea of uh, the secular science and world news, U.S. News and World Report a couple of decades ago said secular science has great difficulty explaining an ice age. It's one of the great science mysteries. And it still is. This has been several decades later. All they really will teach you or try to tell you is there's some sort of a cycle that happens called Milankovitch cycles, where the earth wobbles a little differently, it precesses differently, it's a little further from the sun every so often, but none of these are really very strong forces to really cause an ice age to really bring on a very, very cold period in Earth's history. You need something else, some special conditions. And if this were true, because this happens every so many hundred thousands of years, you would have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ice ages. Yet even the secular community only argues for really five basic ice ages throughout geologic time, as they call it. So why are there supposedly hundreds of millions of years of time in between when this should happen far more often than that? But uh, again, the evidence really shows there's only one ice age. The other evidence is very circumstantial and could be explained by debris flows, etc. That might be a good question to ask later. All right, let's look at what we're going to answer tonight. I'm going to try to answer these three questions. I know you guys all had these on your lips. Is the first three you're going to ask. Some of you are wondering, where is this guy from? He talks funny. I'm from Michigan originally, but I lived in a lot of different states, and I got all messed up. So now I live in Texas. I say y'all, and y'all come back now, and all that kind of stuff. But I lived in Oklahoma City. I lived in Louisiana for a while, which I enjoyed the food. Uh, but most of my life I spent in Michigan, so I can speak good Canadian, eh? <laughs> some of you can speak Canadian, because you're close. You can... I don't know if they say A as much over in this part of Canada as they do in Ontario. Ontario, as soon as you hit the border guards, you're going, where are you going to stay, eh? And I'm, it was like, wow, okay. But I did, I said a lot of that more growing up, but I kind of got out of it. People in Texas, they don't really get the A part. So I have to, they, they struggle down there. All right, how do we know there was an ice age? We'll look at that. Secondly, what caused the ice age, which I'll give you some clues. And then finally, there was a biblical reason for the ice age. And even people that worked for years and years at Pensacola Christian College said, oh, I learned something from that talk. They never knew. And so God gave me this, this much wisdom. Sometimes I get to impart upon you. Uh, but you know, it's, it's amazing what he knew ahead of time. Yet we just see the little remnants of what happened. We're like, oh, man, God is amazing. And this is an amazing thing. The Ice Age is an amazing thing, and we'll see why. All right, let's get on to this. How do we know there's an Ice Age? And again, I... Apologize for you guys out here in Idaho. These are mostly Michigan examples where I grew up. But they're, they had continental glaciation back there. I don't think the continental glaciers made it here. You just had alpine glaciers, I think. Is that right? Anybody study glaciers around here? The continental glaciers were like in the Dakotas and Michigan and New York and all that stuff. So here's the map. I don't think it quite comes down to you guys. Was it really an ice age? So if you look up here, you, know, you guys are over here in the alpine. These are the it was very cold all over, so there, the mountains had a lot more ice as well. And that's what you guys had, I think, around here. So there really was an ice age that mostly affected the northern hemisphere because there's not a lot of land really far south except Antarctica, and that's still covered with the ice from the ice age. So it was Greenland. So God even left remnants behind of the ice age to show there really was an ice age. Here's what happened in Michigan. Actually, four of the five great lakes were carved by the 
glaciers that came across the Great Lakes as they advanced. They advanced because they were thicker to the north. Thick ice wants to thin, just like you pour water out, it wants to thin and flow. Ice flows a little slower, but it does flow. So for several hundred years, we believe the ice flowed and formed up in what's now Hudson Bay. And we can tell a little bit about the thickness because we can see how much the land rose since the ice melted. And some of the areas in Michigan rose several hundred feet. As you go up in Ontario, you're looking at 700, 1,000 feet of land rebound because the weight of that ice was so thick, about a mile thick, just like Greenland, covering much of northern uh, you know, Canada and North America. So they came across after the flood, came across and scraped away the rocks and scoured out the four of the Great Lakes. So you had this, the superior lobe was already there, but it did affect that. This was a very deep geological fold, so it's a little different than the other ones. But the other four down here, uh, I'm from this area, Saginaw area, but this is Lake Huron, for those of you who don't remember, your Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, and this is Lake Erie, and then Lake Ontario is over here. So those four lakes were kind of scoured, and that's why they're so long and linear and kind of follow the patterns as we go around. And there were times when the ice was melting back during the Ice Age. It didn't all just melt back at once. It left lake levels. They call these the Lake Algonquin, and these are native tribes that lived in that area, so they named them after that. But this was 605 feet above sea level, current sea level, and you can see where I lived was all completely underwater. If I'd have been back there 4,000 years ago, I'd have been underwater, and what was left behind was a lot of clay. So I grew up in an area we farmed, but it was a lot of clay, so if it rained hard, it just sat there. So I had to put tiles in the field to drain the water off, because there was so much lake clay from a few hundred years of being an Ice Age lake. And you can see lake terraces, as we'll see, that go around. Then the lakes drained off, and actually, when the ice opened over here and allowed it to drain off, they think this drained off really quickly and carved a big gorge because of this whole lake drained off right through here and zipped out to the St. Lawrence Seaway. It has to do with rebound and ice melting back. But you can follow these things out. And they had to build a bridge to span that gorge because as they go back, that gorge is about 200 feet deep here. So instead of building a causeway, they had to build this suspension bridge, the largest suspension bridge in, North, in uh, I guess, the Western Hemisphere. It's almost five miles long. And has anybody been over that, Mackinac Bridge? So it's like San Francisco, but longer. But anyway, it connects, connects the UP. They built it just before I was born. And so it's, it's quite a feat uh, to, of engineering. But in the middle here, in between, there's a big, deep gorge. That's why they had to span it. So then the lakes came up again one more time for a final one to the Lake Nipissing level. And so, and again, we don't just make these up. You can actually follow the ridges. And here's Michigan's biggest tourist trap, Mackinac Island. Some of you heard of that, a lot of fudge there, and horses and horse-drawn carriages. But there's a ridge all the way around the island. That's that lower level. That's that Nipissing level. And if you go higher, there's a level up here. You can see there's a cliff. These are lake terraces or lake scarps from when it was higher. This is the Algonquin level. So you can see right on Mackinac Island, those two lake levels. And you see along the coast of Michigan, there's a drop off 50 feet as you go further north. And so you can see where the land actually rose up. So there's actual evidence to support these different lake levels. And which ultimately were caused by the Ice Age. And so you can look at, here's Michigan's Grand Hotel. Uh, you can see the, they made a movie there, I think, with Jane Seymour, and Superman, a few years ago. Land Before Time, I think it was called. Uh, but somewhere in time, yeah, that's right. I can't remember. I just turned 62 Sunday, and I can't remember. And I've been on, I've been on trips. I went six nights down the Grand Canyon three weeks ago, and then the last week I spent a week running around Wyoming with my boss and uh, filming stuff for DVDs we're going to have coming out. And so um, I don't know what state I'm in half the time, but I know I'm in Idaho. <laughs> so I know, that, I know that much. So Anyway, this is the Grand Hotel. I, I never can afford to stay there when I go to the island. But nonetheless, uh, it's pretty cool. They have a fort up there as well. And if you look at the levels, you can actually see, this is one of the resorts, you can see there's a cliff. That's that lower cliff that kind of drops off 50 feet. That's that lower lake level. So there's evidence of these lake levels around the Great Lakes that the levels did go up and down. You can also see where the glaciers moved across the land. You can see these lakes that all follow the direction. These big like torch lakes over here, one of the cleanest lakes in Michigan. And then you get all these drumlins, these little landforms up here. All of them show the direction of movement. Nobody really understands how drumlins form even today, somehow under the ice. But they make these little landforms that come along and you can see these drumlins look like this. They're a couple hundred feet long and these little cliffs, and they have different soil, so they plant different crops on those drumlins, and they do some of the fruit trees grow differently on the, versus non-drumlins. But everything shows the direction of flow. And all these are clues that there was 
something scraping and moving material. And you can go to the outcrops in the Upper Peninsula and you can see scratches and striations, big gouges with rocks in the bottom and they slid along and scratched the surface rocks. And you can find rocks like this that are out of place. We have a lot of Canada in Michigan <laughs> because it actually was pushed down. And, and we really do. All these little rocks, you get granite and, and all sorts of things. My brothers and I, we used to hoe beans before they started spraying them with chemicals, which is, you know, we used to hoe beans. I'd make a dollar an hour. Woo! And uh, it was back in the day. You know, today that's $20 an hour or something. I don't know what they say. Probably $2. But anyway, we'd find all these rocks and fossils that, you know, didn't, weren't there. These are called erratics. They're from somewhere else. To the, to the north, they got pushed down by the ice moving. So they started adding all these things up, mostly in Europe originally, and they realized it was an ice age. And you can follow all these ridges across Michigan. They map them out, all these little ridges or moraines where the glaciers carried a bunch of material and then melted and dumped a bunch of that material just dumped out. It's like a big snow plow. And so you can see there's one here in Michigan, one of the Port Huron moraines it's called. Here's kind of a Google image of it. You can see this ridge. And some of these hills are, you know, three, 400 feet high, and this is where Michigan people ski. We don't have big mountains, but we got three or four, you know, four, foot, 100 foot high hills uh, from the glaciers that left behind. So it's not perfectly flat, but it's not as pretty as here. You guys have real mountains. So there's kind of the front of the thing. And Michigan uh, recently, not too long ago anyway, established, because they find so many in the southern half of Michigan where the ice wasn't and were advanced but then melted back, they find a lot of mastodons. These are like m mammoths, but they're a little smaller. And so Michigan finds more mastodons than other states. Even in Texas, there were mammoths. Florida, there were mammoths during the Ice Age. You know, in Kentucky, there were mammoths. But in Michigan, we had a lot more of these mastodons, which are a little bit shorter, kind of like Indian versus the African elephant type of thing. As they used to hunt these because they found a lot of spear points, so humans were actually there as well during the Ice Age eating these things. But how did they get there if they got off the ark in Turkey? How did the mastodons get there? How did the mammoths get there? How did the saber-toothed cats get here? We're going to come back to that. So what caused the Ice Age? We'll look at that first. And the short answer is the flood. The unique conditions created by the flood caused the Ice Age. That's why there was only one Ice Age, the most recent one. So let's look at that. What's the causes? You have to have snow that doesn't melt for many consecutive summers. So you need a lot of snow, and you need it cool enough so it doesn't melt. So if you get enough snow, it builds up, builds up, eventually the pressure of that starts to make ice at the bottom. And if eventually you can get a mile thick of ice. They've done modeling. Uh, Mike Ord, who lives in Bozeman, Montana, is a retired meteorologist, done some, he did a lot of modeling on this. So a lot of this is to his credit. Uh, he says you could have an ice age that lasted five to 700 years pretty easy and have a full-blown ice age in about 200 years uh, building up ice and snow. So you need cooler summers and heavier snowfall. That's all you need. Now, when I was a kid, some of you might remember, maybe you're my age or thereabouts, they were telling us we were going into another ice age. Remember that? Now what are they telling you? Oh, we're all going to die from global warming. And then that wasn't working because it started to cool. Oh, it's climate change. Yeah, it's, I've heard it all. So we're all going to die from an ice age. Now we're all going to die from global warming. And yet God sustains the earth until the day he comes. He promises that in Genesis. If we read the book of Genesis more, it would solve a lot of our problems. Marriage problems. Lots of things. It's all in Genesis. That's where, it all started. That's where we all went wrong. And that's why God had a plan, even back then, to bring Jesus in. God himself would step into the world. You know, we celebrate every Christmas. But the real celebration is Easter Sunday, when he rose, conquered death. And he made that gift free for everybody. Anybody that wants to believe, it's free. You don't have to work your way to heaven. It's free. You just have to accept it. Believe, confess your sins and believe in Jesus. Forgive your sins. So here's all we need. More snow and cooler summers. How do we get cooler summers? Volcanoes. Lots of volcanoes like Mount Pinatubo that erupted back in 1991. I was a grad student in Michigan. I didn't have a garage because I couldn't afford to get a house. I had to just rent a little apartment as a grad student. Got laid off from the oil company I worked for for nine years. Went back for my PhD. Never would have got it. Again, this is all part of God's plan, too, I look back on and see. But it was so cold in 1992, it was 35 below. 
in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which it never gets that cold in that south part of Michigan for several nights. And it's because Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted the year before. So volcanoes that shoot a lot of aerosols into the atmosphere can cause short-term global cooling. Mount St. Helens didn't even do enough. Mount St. Helens was nothing. You guys thought it was something significant. And it is, but it didn't cause any global cooling. But big volcanoes, Indonesian-style volcanoes, cause a lot of global cooling. We can see that even today. But this happened a lot. At the end of the flood, all the volcanoes were peaking, as we'll see in a minute. So cooling at the recent explosive volcano. Here's some examples. Tambora in 1815. This is documented in history. It's known as the year without a summer. Krakatoa in 1883, the whole island blew up. Average global temperatures dropped as much as 1.2 degrees C, which is a couple degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, that's an average. So in the wintertime, it got really cold, for those of you living in Idaho. But you weren't alive then. Mount Pinatubo, we, some of you might remember that. That cooled off. And that was just a 0.5 degree one that was made the thing really, really cold in the north. You might remember it was really cold probably here as well. So here's uh, the research I'm doing. I'm looking at the rocks across the continents, continent by continent by continent. That's another talk. But notice down here at the bottom, the red. The red is the volcanic activity. And this is the early flood rocks, the later flood rocks, a little later. They jump up, you know, a lot more flooding going on. This is the peak of the flood, I think, the Zuni, they call it, around the Cretaceous, Jurassic, you know, those words. And this is the Tejas, this is the receding phase. So this is over half a year, but let's see all the volcanic activity. It, it peaks at the end. That was by design. Because we need volcanic activity to cool the earth. So you could have snow that would build up and build up and build up, particularly in the north, to make the big glaciers that we still have in Antarctica and Greenland. So most volcanic activity is at the end, and here's some of the volcanoes that erupted towards that end. We can map out the ash flows from some of these eruptions in California that go all the way across, halfway across the country. In Yellowstone, these big eruptions that went big, huge areas. They tell you all the time, Yellowstone's going to erupt, it's going to kill half the United States, and it would. But Yellowstone's eruptions were part of the flood. They're not going to erupt as catastrophically probably ever again. So it would kill half the United States but we can still map out the extent of these. These were massive, so it was, the flood was receding, and even those probably a couple hundred years thereafter, there was all this massive volcanic activity, which was caused by a lot of plate movement that happened really fast, which is another talk. But there was a lot of volcanic, there's no doubt there was a lot of volcanic activity peaking, because you can plot the data like I did over many continents and see it. So here's a artist's rendition of Yellowstone erupting, so hopefully you never see this if you visit Yellowstone because it's just the beginning of something. But during the receding phase, this would have been partly covered by water still. And it was pretty bad. So what happened at the end of the flood was you had a lot of residual volcanic activity. It was really peaking, end of the flood. And then I don't put a years in here, but here's like 4,000 years to now. You have all this stuff going on, you know, slowly waning. But God still has the Mount Pinatubos and the Mount St. Helens and the Tambora still erupting to show us this is what happened to give us clues to what's really going on. But they were, they were all peaking at once. All the ring of fire was going off at once, building all those Aleutian Islands, building the islands of Japan, building the isthmus between North America and South America that animals would have to travel. God was building the path, even at the end of the flood. So the spikes kept replenishing the aerosols. You constantly had aerosols in the upper atmosphere blocking out solar radiation. And the solar radiation cooled the earth the upper atmosphere particularly. So it was much colder. Even the Middle East, where Job and Abram were probably living around 2,000 years B.C., the Ice Age was still raging to the north, as we'll see. And it was raging, even though they weren't in the Ice Age, they were still getting a lot more rain and snow. If you read the book of Job, we'll talk about later, there's more references to snow and ice in the book of Job, one of the oldest books of the Bible, than any other book. Because it was probably very, very cold. Egypt was rainy and wet. There was no Sahara Desert. Why would you start a civilization in a desert? But over thousands of years, even the, even the uniformitarian scientists have found that during the, just a few thousand years ago, it was really wet. And so eventually over time, as it became more and more desert, you know, the desert process kind of built up, it took a while to reach an equilibrium, and it got drier and drier and drier, and Egypt had to keep relying more and more on the Nile. But when you hear these stories and you read stories in the Bible, time of Joseph, there was no big desert there. It was just, it was completely different than we're thinking. It was, you know, Israel was the land flowing with milk and honey, even the time of Moses. And that was probably, you know, hundreds of years after the Ice Age. So the climate was completely different just a few thousand years ago. 
What happened was you make a whole new ocean floor during the flood, too. This is the ocean crust, the age of the ocean crust. The red is very young. There's still a little bit oozing out today, about this much per year in most of these plates. But during the flood, uh, John Baumgartner's mapped out and modeled that you would have runaway subduction, moving several yards per second. Not this much per year, yards per second. And you could easily create a whole new ocean crust. And the ocean crust is young compared to the continents. Continents are much older. They're original created crust, most of them. And in fact, you guys right here in Spokane are living on the edge of what used to be North America. If you go much beyond Spokane, you're suddenly in an area that was added on during the flood. And so all these pieces were accreted on by that subduction process along the, in which the magma chamber is exposed in the Sierra Nevadas now. And the volcanoes are still erupting in the Cascades. But that whole area was subducting, subducting away. And that's why you don't have any of the blues and greens over here on this side. It's all sucked underneath North America. There's only blues and greens over here. So this is the ridge over here. It goes underneath North America and comes back out. So it's pretty fascinating. It made the Rockies wide and all that kind of stuff. But that new ocean crust heated the water. You know, the ocean water is like two and a half miles deep, but it got really hot because you made a whole new floor of lava. Everything was lava. So you add all this heat in, and again, Mike Ward's done some modeling. He thinks, you know, it might have been 20 degrees Celsius hotter at the end of the flood. And then it cooled kind of exponentially. So what happens during the glacial maximum might have been 500 years after the flood. That's kind of a guesstimate again. Volcanoes are erupting, cooling the earth, ocean's hot. What's the ocean going to do? Cause a lot of evaporation. A lot of evaporation. So you're coming, lots of rain in Egypt, lots of rain in the Middle East, and lots of snow in the north where it's even colder. Lots of snow here. And that snow became ice. And it was even warm. The water along the coast was warm. So if you were to walk along the coastal areas across if you were coming across the Bering Sea, which we're talking about a little bit, but it was really warm. There's a paper that was published a few years ago talking about these human footprints on this little island north of Vancouver. It shows barefoot humans walking along. It was so warm along the coast because the water was so warm. Even though there was an ice age going on hundreds of miles inland, it was still really mild along the coast. You could walk barefoot. And so we see barefoot human footprints in the ice age sediments in many places around the coast. So what caused the Ice Age was the kind of the heat pump. I think I went over that pretty quickly. I'm gonna, let me review. It was you had lots of volcanic activity, cooling the atmosphere. So in the north and the extreme south, it would have been much colder. And there's a lot of land in the north, so that built up as ice. And lots of rain and snow, because it was cooler in the north, built up because the oceans were hot. Hot water evaporates faster. So if you have, from making a whole new seafloor, you have very, very hot water. So those two factors, hot ocean water that took hundreds of years to cool down because water holds heat. If you study chemistry, they talk about the high specific heat to water. God made water very, very unique. When it freezes, it expands. So it floats on top of the water so the fish can still swim underneath. Most things contract. Water does to a point, and then it expands when it makes the crystalline structure of ice. And so no other mineral really does that. Water is a very, and that's why God started with water. You read the book of Genesis. Water is what, in the very first verses of the Bible, the spirit was hovering across the water. So a lot of the earth was made out of water, we think. And then he used some of that water to make other things. But water is very, very special. We need it to live. But the water was evaporating at a much higher rate. And of course, it comes up as fresh water, leaves the salt behind, came down as snow, and that snow built up ice. And it was so cool because of the volcanoes. So those two factors together, really, were like the perfect storm for an ice age. And so there's one ice age that happened as a consequence of the flood, moving all those continents around, making that ocean floor, heated the water, and also the subduction process to get rid of the old ocean crust I never told you my California joke. <laughs> See, everything from Spokane over was added on, up and down the whole coast. So almost all of California, Oregon, Washington, was all added on. The geology is really all kind of screwed up. And to me, I think you become like the geology you live in. <laughs> at, least, at least politically. You know, you guys are on the original stable continent that moved around, but 
All right, if you're from California, I apologize. That's not really true. But it does seem that way at times. The West Coast is really kind of, the geology is really screwed up. Explains a lot of things. All right, biblical reason for the Ice Age. Let's go on with the biblical reason. There was a reason. I alluded to some of this earlier. All right, here's the, here's the story here. Here's the flood. If you go back and count the genealogies, you end up with like 2349 B.C., so it's about 4,400 years ago or so. Sometimes at ICL we round off to 4,500. I don't know why, but our editors want us to be consistent. So we're like, oh, about 4,500 years ago. But uh, if you read the Bible, it comes up with about this. And, of course, Abram or Abraham was living around maybe 2,000 B.C., according to most biblical scholars, which I'm not, but I believe them. And we think Job might have been around the same time because Job is one of the oldest books of the Bible, if not maybe the oldest book written before Moses finished out Genesis and everything. But uh, they might have been contemporaries. Nobody really knows for sure. But the Ice Age maximum wasn't reached until maybe a couple hundred years into Abram's life. But he was living in an area where the ice didn't cover. You know, it was further to the north, but it was affecting his climate. So it's still a big change. Here's the book of Job. I talked about Job probably lived about the time of Abraham. And again, my, our founder, Henry Morris, went through and wrote a whole book on this and at the time, there was no computers. He had to do all by hand, but he counted all the references to snow and ice in the book of Job and said there's more in the book of Job than any other book of the Bible, including Genesis. So there was much cooler weather going on in his, his lifetime. But here's a very complicated, the most complicated thing you're going to see tonight, besides trying to understand my accent, is... Here's the average sea temperature. Again, we talked about maybe 20 or 30 degrees hotter. This one shows 30. Again, this is from Mike Ord's work mostly, so he, we're not really certain how hot it was. With all that new ocean crust forming, you would heat the ocean water quite a bit to cause a lot of evaporation. Well, that's going to cool with time. So here's the global temperatures cooling with time. And then today we kind of reached a, a steady state. And about 500 years after the flood, we think maybe that was the glacial maximum. He had enough time to build up you know, a thick ice sheet, maybe a mile thick across much of North America and Asia, you know, Siberia, Europe, and that sort of area as well, and all the alpine glaciers around here. And so you kind of reach this peak. Was, what does that do? Well, that sucks up a lot of water. If you get mile thick ice across you know, much of northern North America, Siberia, you know, much of northern Asia, Europe, you're going to suck up a lot of water. And they've estimated here how, how far, how much sea level has risen since the maximum ice age. Of course, they say 22,000 years ago, we think the biblical timeline is correct, you know, 4,000 some years ago over here, maybe 4,000 about here, 4,500, 4,000. And so their number's a little bit off, but they do see similar results, that the ice was you know, causing sea levels to be lower, 120 meters lower. And so since most of you aren't scientists or physicists or anything like that, you might not know what a meter is. Yeah, it's about a yard with a few extra inches on the end. And so you're looking at, you know, you multiply that by three. Don't do math in public. You get 360 feet probably with that little extra on there, maybe even closer to 400 feet. So sea level would have dropped about 400 feet, 380 feet or so. That's a lot of drop during the Ice Age peak, during the maximum here. But it also means it came back up that far. So when they tell you, you know, ice is going to flood all the major cities in the world, in the next, it already did. It's not going to come up much more, even if you melt off I think it's about 75 or so feet if you melt all the ice in Antarctica and Greenland. Yeah, but most of it already happened. That's why I said most climate change already happened as a consequence of the flood. And so what happens here is this goes up and up and up. As this goes down, of course, cooling, the, the heat pump goes off. You no longer have high evaporation rates because the ocean is now cooled down to what it is today. And the volcanoes are also shutting off at the same time. So now you just have an occasional eruption. So you're no longer cool in the atmosphere, and so the ice starts to melt. Within maybe 100 years of these conditions, you can melt all the ice off really quickly. And so sea level arose very, very fast. So what was happening, and if you look at here, in the, I put this in there already, the Tower of Babel is about here. Nobody knows exactly when the Tower of Babel was because it's in Peleg's lifetime. I think it's like 100 to 300 years after the flood, depending, you know, give or take a year or two. 
So we just kind of pick the middle and say about 200 years after the flood. It might have been the Tower of Babel. And so that was kind of in the middle of the Ice Age, not even the maximum. You hadn't reached the maximum Ice Age yet. You're still building up snow and ice, maybe, for a few hundred more years. But what did humans do? Of course, they said, let's uh, stay here. God told us to spread out, but let's stay here and build a big you know, monument to ourselves and do great things with Nimrod. They were disobeying, again, within about 200 years after the flood. But during the glacial maximum, you can see all that brown on there. That's the new land that shows up if you drop sea level 380 feet. This is all land. All oh, this is land. This is land. It's all land along here. Remember, there's no ice on the coast. This is the uniformitarian view. We believe there wasn't ice right along the coast because the water was too warm. So you could walk along here. You know, there's the, how do you walk in ice? So they're wrong because they're walking barefoot over here. So anyway, there was Bering Sea. You can't see it down here. We kind of cut it up, but that's all dry land. You could walk right across from Asia to North America. You could walk down here. The isthmus formed because the volcanoes down here. God had a plan. And all this is dry land, this is all dry land. Not much Africa changed, but a lot over here. But you still had to make a little jump right there. It wasn't a walkway all the way to Australia. And that's why I think some of the animals in Australia are very unique. Because only certain animals got down there. You didn't get a lot of predators down in Australia. There's no lions, tigers, and bears. So the kangaroos survived. And all these marsupials survived. I think God had a plan down there to preserve some of these animals that would have died out. They did back here. There had to be kangaroos in Asia. There's even paintings in the caves in India of kangaroos. Because they had to come from over here. You know, the, where the ark landed, they had to come across and get over to here. They had to come across this way, come across over to here and over to here. All the animals had to migrate, but they could walk. For several hundred years, after the flood, when the ice age was at its maximum, you could walk almost anywhere except for a little bit of jumping right here. Just a little tiny bit. And again, humans were disobeying. They were saying, let's stay here. Tower of Babel might have been here. Some people say it was up in Turkey. But somewhere in this region, we're pretty certain that's where the Tower of Babel was. And Mount, the mountains of Ararat were up here. And uh, I don't really think the ark landed on Mount Ararat itself. That's something you can ask me about. I have an article on our website about that. Uh, it's the mountains of Ararat, you know, nearby but not quite there. For, for a reason. Partly because it was an Ice Age volcano that was erupted in the Ice Age. It's a lot. So if it did land there, it's covered with lava now. So. Now, Dr. John Morris, my colleague, is kind of annoyed with me. He's like, Tim, I went up there 13 times looking for that thing. I hit by lightning. You tell me I went to the wrong place? I'm like, well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody really knows. But anyway, somewhere the Tower of Babel is over here somewhere. Some of you know John Morris. You guys know John Morris? My, my predecessor. He's still on our board. Anyway, here's a rendition of the Tower of Babel. We think it might have been some sort of a ziggurat because you go to Mexico and you see ziggurats. You go all over the world, you see step pyramids. Why did all these civilizations build step pyramids? Because they traveled over there after they saw the Tower of Babel and said, hey, let's build our own. Why would you just randomly build step pyramids all over the world? Chichen Itza. I climbed up Chichen Itza when you still could. And there's people at the top that didn't know how to get down. You guys been there? It's steep. And the steps are little bitty steps. Like, mm. So I went down kind of sideways. It's a 45 degree angle. People are stuck there. How am I going to get down? I'm like, well, there's a rope. But that's why they finally stopped letting people go up there because people couldn't get down. But it was a ziggurat. Very steep. So here's a painting from the Tower of Babel, Disobedience and the Dispersal. Of course, what did God say? Fill the earth. The animals were filling the earth and humans were disobeying, once again. That's what we do. But we can get forgiveness. So here's the, the timing. This is the secular, or you know, whatever you want to call it, conventional geology, anthropology pathway. And look where it all starts. This is what the secularists say. They do the work for us. They have the years wrong, but they got the paths right. Look at this. Everything starts at the Tower of Babel. And they go this way, and they go this way, and they go this way. You could walk anywhere during the Ice Age, except for a little bit of Australia. You had to take a little boat. 
but thinking, but Tim, they could have taken a boat to North America. We didn't need the land bridges. Well, tell that to the mastodons and the mammoths. You know, they got here. There was animals to hunt. When humans finally did walk over here and follow the tra- animals, they were able to walk right across from here to there and down, all the way down here. There's all these debates in the you know, world about when did this isthmus form and how the animals get to South America. And the Bible gives us the answers. You know, it's all because of the consequence of the Ice Age that you, that you were able to get these animals across to these continents. They didn't have to float across everything. Now, admittedly, some animals did float. And they recently, because at the time, uh, I looked at Iceland. And I wrote an article about Iceland. A guy in Iceland is a geologist there. Volcanologist studies volcanoes. And we had a Zoom session. And he said, well, there's a bunch of coal, lignite really, not really, really low-grade coal, on the coastal areas around Iceland. And these trees, some of the trees that they found they identify, have no way to disperse themselves. You know, there's no long-distance dispersal. And they're trying to figure out how did these trees get there. And they said there must have been islands that they could follow and jump across from here. But you look in the seafloor maps today, there's no islands. There's no way to get those trees there. Those trees are part of the floating lo- you know, mats after the flood. They were still floating around when the Iceland volcanoes were erupting. And they just happened to trap some of this floating log mats on the edges of the of Iceland. So the Bible helps explain a lot of things if you have the biblical perspective Oh, there are still great mysteries to the secular community. But to me, this map is just amazing. If you ignore the years, it's exactly what I would draw. Animals did this, humans followed. But they only had a very limited window of time. And they were disobeying and saying, let's stay here in the Middle East. So God had to come in there. You know, they, and they said, let us, because the Trinity, let us confound the languages. And so that forced the humans to do what they should have been doing is make it across from Siberia, what's now Siberia, across Beringia into North America and ultimately into South America. So we have deer over here. So we had mammoths over here, mastodons. Even though they went extinct, all these other animals came across as well. And this is what Europe looked like during the peak of the Ice Age. This is all dry land. So you could walk right across from France over to England. All dry land. And they actually found a lot of civilizations, you know, ancient civilizations from the Ice Age along these coastal areas. They call it Doggerland in the North Sea. So there was a lot of areas that already flooded. So what are they telling you to say? Oh, we're going to flood. Well, it already happened. And what did people do? They moved. You can move. If the water's coming up, you'll move. Unless you live in New Orleans. You try to build bigger walls, which I, I don't agree with. I, I worked there for four years, but I lived in Slidell, Louisiana, which is above sea level. Because I said, I don't want to live below sea level. That's not a good idea. And then Katrina hit five years later. And I'm like, Ugh, see? There's going to be a bigger hurricane. You know, that's all you need is one to hit. And they, I asked him when I lived there. I said, why do you not, you know, what, don't you worry about that? Like, no, they always miss. I wish I would have recorded that. I asked a bunch of people, they, oh, they always miss. And they did for a long time, but, you know, it's just a matter of time. But anyway, this is a, you know, if this would have been this way in World War II, what would have happened? <laughs> Hitler would have taken England. It would have just, tanks would have just gone right across. And one of the most amazing stories, it's nothing to do with our talk, but it has to do with this. One of the most amazing stories I read is the the British were able to escape at Dunkirk only because the Germans were told by their high command to stop the tanks. Rest their tanks for a day. And to this day, they don't know exactly why they were told that. I think that's God's hand. God steps into history. When things are at their worst, he'll step in. Or they never would have made it. They would have been completely surrounded and the whole army would have been you know, in prison camp. 300 and some thousand soldiers got away only because they stopped their tanks. The, the guys in the command, let's go, let's go. They think it's because they used to be cavalry officers and they used to have to rest their horses for a day. And they were thinking, we got to rest their tanks. And that's, that's all they can come up with. All the old, the old command were all cavalry officers. So the cavalry took over as tank command. You know, that's kind of what happened. So. But fortunately, the timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. Scientific evidence tells us there was an ice age. So you can you know, go to Europe and Siberia 
And you can come here to North America, even around here, we probably could find some evidence that there really was an ice age. And the ice age was caused by the flood, the conditions of the flood. There was only one ice age. You know, there might have been a couple different advances and retreats and that sort of thing. Ice doesn't really retreat. It's kind of like Patton. It just melts back. You know, it doesn't, that's why it leaves all the debris behind. But the ice age was necessary for dispersal. That was the reason. These are the answers to the question. Scientific evidence tells us there was an ice age. The ice age was caused by the flood, the conditions of the flood, heating the water by making a new seafloor, volcanoes erupting, cooling the atmosphere. Perfect recipe for a perfect storm of ice for hundreds of years, and that allowed the dispersal. God had a plan all along. He had a plan even through the flood that this was going to happen. And, of course, he had a plan for us, salvation for us. Even from the time Adam and Eve sinned, he already had his plan in place. He was going to redeem us through his own son, God himself. And this is kind of, when I find out some little truth, you know, by my research, this is what I come back to. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yeah, I'm just scratching the surface of God's thoughts. And it amazes me that we have such a wonderful, powerful God. And he cares about each and every one of us. He's not some God that went out there and started everything four and a half billion years ago and just kind of set it in motion. He's a personal God. He tells us that it happened 6,000 years ago, and the evidence really is there that this only happened 6,000 years ago, and the ice age is only 4,000 years ago. But that's another talk as well. But it's amazing to see, after God thinks things and, and does things, that we can piece together what he did and why he did it. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And here he's talking about his son, Jesus. He even had a plan for you and a plan for me. I didn't know the plan. I didn't know why I got a PhD. I got laid off, so well, I guess I'll get a PhD. I was just going to work in the oil and gas business and make a lot of money. Right now, I'd be making 350000 a year as a geologist working for an oil company. I didn't make anywhere near that, but I got laid off because God had other plans. And then I came to ICR. Just the opening just kind of opened up, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. It was God's plan. So I can be here tonight telling you that how amazing God is, you know, that his word is true. Every bit of it. There was a flood. There was an ice age. And all these are part of God's plan to repopulate the earth, as we'll see. But God commandeth his... Com commandeth? Commandeth. Commandeth. Did I get that right? I had it wrong at one point. We have to use King James because some churches like King James only, so that's why we use King James. But God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, as I said earlier, even though we are sinners, we still are. Christ died for us, and much more than that, being not justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So there will be another judgment coming where the earth's going to burn by fire. It won't be another flood. He promised us that. The sign is the rainbow. And, but God did have a plan. And he has a plan for you. If you're not a Christian, I encourage you to talk to the pastor today or talk to, talk to someone in the leadership here at the church or even talk to your friend. It's free. Just like our acts and facts. Now this book here, you've got to pay for. <laughs> but God's love is free because he loves each and every one of us. But this is the book. There's a chapter in this book. It's a 496-page book that we have in the back. It's our most expensive book. It came out in 2020, right in the middle of the COVID thing in March. It came in March when everything, when Fauci said, shut everything down. And they did. I'm like, why? But anyway, so it came out and it still sold first 3,000 copies in about a year. And now they're in the second printing where we fix some of the mistakes. So you'll get a better book than the first printing because there's always more mistakes in the first printing. But we fixed some of those. But there's a whole chapter on the Ice Age in here. I talk about the history of it. And I go in, I think it's chapter 16 or something like that where you, you know, people didn't even believe there was an ice age 150 years ago. But then they started to piece together the evidence there really was. But there's a reason for everything that happens in history, including the wars and the battles. But this, is, this book really details uh, the evidence for the flood. It looks at three continents worth of oil well data and, and rock data where we had cores that were drilled all the way down to the crust, plotted them all up. And since I wrote the book, I have two more continents done. And they still show the same pattern, that there was a progressive flood, just as described in Genesis chapter 7 and in chapter 8 when the water went down. So I believe the flood peaked at day 150, 
and then it took another half a year or so to go back down. That's the way I read the word, and it seems to fit the geology. And we, this book covers a lot of that. But if you don't buy any book tonight, and you only have one book to buy, this would be the one. $10, it's about 400 and some pages long. Not as well illustrated as my book. My book's got lots of color pictures and maps and wonderful things. But this, and I, and I apologize, it's not 500 pages, it's only 496. <laughs> but this one's 400 and some pages too. We just updated this one during COVID. We rewrote a bunch of chapters and added a bunch of stuff about the Ice Age. And this talks about humans and chimps, how we're only about 82% like humans and chimps, you know, similarity in DNA. But the Italian school, the 98% stuff is a lie. Because they just cherry-picked. When they look at the whole thing, like my colleague Jeff Tompkins did, and even a, a uh, secular scientist did the same thing, came up with the same results, about 82% thereabouts. So we're really nothing like a chimp. That's a big difference in DNA, almost 20%. So don't believe this 98% nonsense that people walk around wearing. And then there's a dinosaur book I wrote a few years earlier than my other book. This is some people, I don't want to brag, but some people say this is the best book out there in the creation community. Uh, Ken Ham sells this in his ARC. You know, we're not affiliated with him. He used to work for ICR years ago, and he went on his own. But it is worth seeing the ARC. Uh, so if you get over there. But inside the ARC, I was signing some of these books when I visited, put them back on the shelf. They almost arrested me. For, I said, no, no, I really wrote this. This is my picture in the back. And, and uh, anyway, they, yes, yes, I won't do it again. And off I went. That was my first arrest. All right. The, uh, on the art. No, that didn't, it didn't happen. Okay. But I did sign some books there randomly. But this book, really, if you're interested in dinosaurs, and I know everybody is, I didn't give you a dinosaur talk tonight, but I'll be giving that to, I think, one of the colleges here. If the dinosaurs, you know, people wonder about dinosaurs. Did they have feathers? Did they really run through snow? Did they swim under the ice? No. This explains why. That, that's nonsense. You watch the latest movie? Swimming under the ice. Like, come on. Did you guys see that? The news? Anyway, it's, it got worse. The movies went along, they got worse and worse and worse. Don't believe the movies, kids. But this, I try to give you the, I used to teach a dinosaur class in college, so I put, you know, a fair discussion of each type of dinosaur group in there, but I tied it into the Bible and how they could fit in the ark and how they did go in the ark because God didn't exclude anything. But there's only about 60 kinds of dinosaurs. There's just a lot of variety. Just like in this room, we all look different. In this room, if, if scientists measured all of our bone structure, we'd come up with 17 different species probably in here. That's what they do. If it's different, all oh, your new species. And so there's all these dinosaurs that are really almost the same thing, just a slight difference, and they call it a new species. But there's only maybe 60 or maybe 70 kinds. And if you bring juveniles, it's even better because they don't take as much room. So my wife and I, because she's taught kindergarten at a Christian school for many years, and she had to cross out the millions of years and 66 million years this and all that with a Sharpie. And so we said, we've got to write some books. So we wrote two books. This is the first one. David, why are you shining at me? Oh. And he's got a book pack, too. There's a special pack that I don't have a picture of where you can buy the Creation Basics and Beyond book, that $10 book, plus three DVDs that are $10 each. You get all four for $30. So we do have one special out there in the back. But you're in the middle of my big plans for Henry. You interrupted. <laughs> He's a good guy. Anyway, see, this is Henry right here. He's born. This is mom. And these are his sisters. How do you know? Because the eyelashes. <laughs> Apparently, girl dinosaurs had eyelashes. I don't know if that's true or not. We had to kind of, we, we hired an artist to do this, and we went with it. But he's a duck-billed dinosaur, and and you'll find he has a special, God has a special plan for him. We base this on Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has a plan even for these animals. And there's a second book out there in the series. There's a third book eventually that we haven't published yet. But this, the first two books are out there in the series. And they're actually a story you can read to your kids. You know, we wrote it for our grandkids. It's for like four to seven-year-olds. And we sneak some Bible facts in there, sneak a few science facts in there when you're not looking. And it has a good conclusion because it points you to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We don't do this if it wasn't for salvation through Jesus' blood. God didn't have to do that. But he loves you that much. Who would die for you if they didn't love you? Each and every one of you. 
So we try to put that out here and teach children that God has a plan for not only dinosaurs, but for them as well. And then, again, some of you are going, I don't have any money. This is free. Just like God's love, God's salvation is free. This is free. Sign up, you get this Acts and Facts magazine mailed to your house every other month. We started going every other month so we have more time to do research. Because we're only down to like four scientists right now. We're trying to hire a couple more. And so we got one guy hired, but he can't start writing yet because he's working on some book in the secular world. He's trying to finish it before they realize he's a creationist and they yank it on him. <laughs> so he's trying to finish up this book. And uh, but he'll, he's, he's a great asset. And we have another guy that's finishing school. We're going to try to hire him as well. So we're going to try to add a few more scientists to our staff. But uh, we're, I think I say we're doing some really cool things. Biologically, we're taking cave fish, blind cave fish, and we're trying to bring back their sight. And so we're trying to get the fish to live, and that's we're doing real empirical science. Nobody's doing this. No other ministry is doing this. No secular university is doing this. You know, we think that these switches go on and off based on what they sense. And so the, the animals can grow hair, and they get big during the Ice Age because they sensed it was cooler, bigger, retained more body heat. So you had beavers this big during the Ice Age. We can find the skeletons. Mastodons really big. You know, they grew hair because it was cold. So their bodies would turn on. And within a couple of generations, they probably became hairy elephants, whereas before they probably weren't. And so that's what our research is about at ICR. That the biological side is going back and taking some of these icons of evolution, like blind cavefish, and showing that these things can maybe restore their sight within a couple of generations. And so we're doing some really cool things. I think the geology is the best, but, you know, I'm still trying to finish the world. I've got one last big continent to go, and then I've got to write another book, but we'll see. But this is free. You can keep up on what we're doing by getting this every two months. And there's also the Days of Praise, this little tiny little book here. Say every three months you get this daily devotional, which is really cool. Really, this is really good stuff by our founder, Henry Morris. And we added a lot of new stuff as well, but this is free. Anyway, I've got time for some questions, about 10 or so minutes. I stalled long enough so I wouldn't have too many questions. Don? <laughs> yeah, um, if the earth was covered with water, <clears throat> uh, where did all the water go? Uh, it went back to the oceans. See, when the oceans are formed, the way plate tectonics kind of works, and John Bumgarner modeled out, is you make new ocean crust, it's very hot, and it gets pushed up. So the original oceans were there, probably did a lot of the flooding. They just got, as you made new ocean crust, just like the ridges are high today, the rest of the oceans are cooled and sank. But if you're making a lot of ocean crust really fast, you're going to make those ridges get really, really wide, and the bottom of the ocean is going to go up, and you can push about a mile of water onto the continents. And then as the ocean, as the crust cooled, it drew the, helped draw the water back. And then God says he provided a wind to blow it off as well. But we see evidence of that. In the Gulf of Mexico, there's this huge sand out in the 200 miles offshore in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico that keeps getting bigger as they drill more called the Whopper Sand. So are, are, part you, of the receding phase. are you saying that the oceans got deeper and the land got pushed up? Well, the land didn't go up as much as the mountains. I don't think the whole continents went up, but the, there was some isostatic rebound, if you want to call it that, for lack of a better word, in the areas where there was subduction going on because you thicken the crust. So thicker crust is going to go up higher and go down deeper. So on the West Coast, the Rockies, and most of the mountains of the world, actually, 80% of the world's mountains all formed in the receding phase, which is kind of a mystery to the secular community. How do you have all these mountains forming at once all over the earth? But it's because of thickening of crust. So it kind of goes back to the idea of catastrophic plate tectonics, rapid movement of the plates. And, and, but the oceans, are, to me, are the key. If you didn't make a new ocean crust, you wouldn't be able to push it up. And that's one of the reasons why the continents were separated. And then God had to have a plan to get the animals back was to bring on the Ice Age, which all this kind of ties, you know, it's like dominoes. Ding, 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 they're falling down. All these things kind of happen because God had it all planned out. But I think the oceans, as they cooled and the water drained off, and there was some uplift to the continents as well, but it might not have been all the continents, just at least the, at least the mountains came up, most of them, like the Rockies and the Alps and the Himalayas. There was no Himalayas before the flood. We got seashells on the top of Mount Everest because those were pushed up as the floodwaters were receding. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of other things that could go into that, but I think the oceans are really where most of the water came. You could argue the fountains of the deep provided some water, 
but we don't know how much. You can't separate the water out. You know, the, there's no way to trace which water came from where. But I think a lot of it just came from the pre-flood oceans that were pushed up from below as you made a new seafloor, like your bathtub being pushed up from below. You know, water's got to go somewhere, and you keep making these tsunami waves kept going higher and higher and higher, so you see this progressive flood burying the shallow seas first, and then the wetland areas, the little upland areas later. So you see a very orderly ecological zonation of the fossil record globally because it was happening everywhere at the same time. And so we use a lot of the rock data to kind of piece together the earth as well into some sort of Pangaea originally, and then that spread apart. But that, again, ultimate cause of all that also added to the Ice Age, they provide the conditions for the Ice Age. Good, thanks, Tim. So first of all, I want to say that um, I got in trouble for teaching uh, my fifth grade Sunday school class that dinosaurs were actually on the ark, huh. but, but that was in Portland, so that, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> no, that's very important. <laughs> There's actually a lot of evidence that dinosaurs did live, you know, for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years after the flood. Even. Yeah, there There's wouldn't be all lots these of carvings and knights in shining armor saving damsels and, in and, distress. And, and, there and the description of behemoth, I think, in, yeah. in Job. But the question I have is, I mean, you're obviously a PhD, you've got credentials. <sighs> when you stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against a secular scientist and you present all this information of a biblical... <laughs> Uh, reason for all this, the Ice Age, what kind of reception do you get with that? I mean... Well, they usually think I'm nuts. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's, their, it's coming from their worldview. You know, their worldview won't allow for something like that. They won't allow for a short amount of time for things to happen. You know, my strongest evidence is the database I'm building on the continents of the rocks. And to me, the, the database, of, you know, which isn't the talk I gave you, this is more of a of a biblical, you know, church talk. It's not as heavy in the, the science as some of my other talks. It really shows data. But when, when atheists have read my book, the Carved in Stone book, the orange one, they're like, we love your data, Tim, but we hate your interpretation. And, you know, but it's, it's the real rocks that are there. And so I, my point is, how do you argue with the rocks? You know, they're really telling the truth. They're showing there was a progressive flood. Every kind of doing the same thing at the same time. Every continent, all five that I've studied so far, all do about the same thing at the same time. They show the same progression of the flood. They don't flood everything right away. You know, they flood parts of it. In Genesis 10 and 25, mm -hmm. it uh, talks about in the days of Peleg, the mm -hmm. um, earth was split. Uh, mm -hmm. Would that uh, indicate, or in your opinion, the continental drifts at that? I don't think so. I talk about that in my book as well because I think that would have killed too many people. You know, that would have gone back to the flood conditions where you have the plates moving very, very quickly, uh -huh. causing the tsunami waves, you know, tremendous. I mean, we're talking tsunami waves were, you know, 500,000 foot high, huge tsunamis, huge, bigger earthquakes than we've ever recorded. And so I think that if you'd tried to do move the earth then, you would have just gone back to the flood conditions. You know, that was the conditions that caused the flood in the first place. So I think, you know, other people have said it might be the division of waterways on the new surface of the earth. Dividing of the waterways, some of the, I think John Morris said that in some of his stuff at ICR. Uh, I think it's mostly just the dividing of the, referring to the dividing of the nations based nations. on their, based on their, but I don't believe it was geologic you know, other than maybe waterways, you know, rivers. Okay, that occurred during the Because you would have, yeah, yeah, because you would have, you know, gone right back to the conditions that I think caused the flood in the first place to, and you would have killed everybody. You know, you had these huge tsunamis, these huge, you know, movements of the Earth's crust where you could actually stand there like the bow of the Titanic and you're moving along, you know, this much per second. And so you gotta wonder, do these people notice that the ground was moving? Unless, if they're at the coast, they might have noticed. But uh, you know, humans are probably scrambling for the highest location. I think humans and mammals mostly lived at the higher elevations anyway. And dinosaurs lived at lower elevations. That's why they were buried before the, most of the mammals are buried later because it went over the top and spread the humans and the animals all over the surface. And if you don't bury things deep, you're not going to make a fossil. And so I think one of the other questions I get a lot is, why aren't there more human fossils? Well, I think because they weren't buried deep enough. They were buried at the very end. God wiped them off, he said. And a lot of them might have gone into the oceans. They were eaten by the you know, scavengers in the oceans. Or they weren't buried deep enough to become a fossil. You've got to bury things fast and deep to make fossils. And so you, they always say, right away. And so I think the humans were you know, living right to the end. There might have been a billion people on the earth. Who knows? And... 
you know, they just were scattered all over by the waves going over the top. Tsunami waves are not slow. But it only went 15 cubits or about 23 feet over the highest hills and stripped you know, Canada right down to the crust. And Brazil right down to the crust. And Sub-Saharan Africa right down to the crust. I can see these were the high areas. All the, all the rocks thin towards Canada. So that was a hill in the pre-flood world. Probably where humans and most of the common mammals were living. They were buried on top of the dinosaurs. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. One more question. Last one here in the front. <laughs> when Mount St. Helens erupted, uh, didn't something happen through that that was a shock to the uh, oh, yes. secular? Oh, yes, yes. Can you explain that? Yeah, I've, yeah that, I've read, we have an article on that in our new parks book even. But uh, what that showed, and that when I was a geologist student at the time, I was uh, starting my geology classes, and it totally changed the textbooks in the next 20 years. It took about 20 years, but it changed the textbooks where they now realize there are occasional catastrophes. <laughs> Up until then, there were no catastrophes. You know, it was all uniformitarian and slow deposition of sand and soils, and you could, you know, it, it was really kind of ridiculous. Now they recognize that the Earth is mostly sculpted by occasional catastrophes, and of course, they still think over millions of years. They believe the Earth flooded, too, six different times, just not all the way, over millions of years. Because they see the evidence. But I just think these are like pancakes. Just lay them out there. There's no evidence of time in between. They just layer upon layer. Just like Grand Canyon, you can see the layers. There's no erosion in between the layers. Even though it's supposed to be 160 million years here, and 10 million years here. Where's the erosion? Where are the canyons? Like Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon now is supposed to be 6 million years old, according to the secularists. So every 6 million years, you should have huge canyons forming all over. But yet you see rocks that go from here all the way to the East Coast. They're pretty much flat all the way. So when you see the oil wells, you can really see, you can plot it all up, and that's what I did. You can see these rock layers go across most of the middle part of our country. They're perfectly flat still. They just get turned up by the mountains. It's just amazing, Love this it. pancake. So what you're saying is we can actually trust the Bible? <laughs> Absolutely you can trust God's <laughs> Word. God's Word is true. If you got nothing else out of this talk, God's Word is true. Amen. And that Jesus is the reason we do it all, because he loves us so much that he died for us. Amen. Praise the Lord.